Hey everyone, welcome to our seventh video. And uh, my name is Amritansh. Uh, this is Tamal. Hey Tamal, how are you? Hey Amritansh, yeah, I'm good. How about you? I'm amazing, thank you. Uh, so today we are going to talk about cognitive world models. So if you guys remember in the last video, we were talking about world models. And as you know, we this is an ongoing series. So make sure uh, go through the previous videos. But as you already know that in last video, we kind of focused heavily on the world models. And there was a mathematical approach and we wanted to talk about very deeply about all that. Now today we are gonna think more about the mind itself. And this is why we said the word cognitive. Here. Okay, so we are gonna talk about few models that are related to mind and brain and which are according to us very important in understanding the overall problem of general intelligence. Now we will give you kind of a varied overview like what different models are and you have to understand these are very like research in nascent states. I know like psychology is not really nascent but a lot of that research has very recently uh, started to uh, kind of flow over in the direction of artificial intelligence. Okay, so a lot of research has happened and there could be issues, okay. <clears throat> these are initial ideas and there could be issues that could go wrong here, okay. So we will have to be very uh, particular in understanding the ethos with what, why, and why we are going with this, and where is the uh, scenario. It might not all come fruitful, it might take some time. But this will give you a very excellent overview where we are currently standing and where we are heading. All right, okay. Now, this is amazing, and uh, I think uh, this has been ta uh, taken from the Tenenbaum paper, and we will give you the references and the link, and I think uh, these ideas, like how do we really grow a mind, and uh, all these statistics, structure and abstraction is a very big question that we have, okay? So we just do not always think about an element or something only in complete lack or like in a total vacuum. I think I always like to think is that whenever I think uh, about any, any object, let's say bagel or maybe ice cream, it does reminds me ice cream is sweet, ice cream is cold. Uh, it also reminds me ice cream are uh, for me, ice cream and refrigeration kind of go hand in hand. Like whenever I think ice cream at, or storing ice cream, I always think about re uh, refrigeration around it. It's just something that I do. And I'm fairly sure most of you do this actually. Okay, you cannot imagine ice cream in room temperature for half an hour. That's that's not something you want to imagine, right? <laughs> so Tenenbaum actually tries to address uh, these three different questions and uh, we will recommend everyone to kind of go with this paper. How does abstract knowledge guide learning and inference from sparse data? And this is very important because the data that you actually get from the real world is extremely sparse. It's almost never going to be very rich. Uh, when we say rich, we do not mean that we cannot gather a high or multidimensional data. It's just that there are so much missing information with any data that comes okay. But the good news is our brain kind of fulfills that information. Like we have talked about this in previous videos that brain kind of puts these answers in these like fill in the blank scenario, like even in pattern recognition, we were talking about this. And uh, this is the first question. And the second one asks like, what form does abstract knowledge takes and across different domains and tasks? And this is again, very important. Many times and uh, in the last video itself, we talked about like, when you think about it, bicycle or any, any concept, you cannot think about everything. So you have this abstract model in the world about a bicycle or a man, riding a bicycle, okay, and then you try to interpolate based on that. Now, what form does abstract knowledge take across different domains and tasks? We kind of try to decide this. How is abstract knowledge itself acquired? This itself is a very big question, right? Okay, fine, we said that, okay, we can create abstract knowledge. So guys, when I'm saying the word abstract knowledge, what it means is, let's say, I'm talking about Pythagoras theorem. Okay, let's imagine that. Now, we all understand the equation, like we understand it is fundamentally, uh, your hypotenuse, uh, hypotenuse is nothing but, or you can say hypotenuse square is basically the perpendicular square plus the base square. That's how we think for a right angle triangle. But many times we can imagine it also as a shortest distance between two points. So if I were to say shortest uh, distance between two points in a Cartesian coordinate, everyone kind of understand, okay, this guy is talking fundamentally hypotenuse and that will be derived through Pythagoras theorem itself. Now here you can see, we kind of come up with uh, hierarchies immediately, right? Shortest distance line and then the hierarchies. Okay, how do you determine the length of this line? Okay. So, and 
Although this is like uh, what Tenenbaums and his team basically presented is like, uh, and they went into hierarchical Bayesian models. And I think you guys and all of us can see this here. And we are trying to show you through these pictures itself that the, let's say the whole animal kingdom, flora, fauna, everything gets connected uh, through hierarchies. And of course we apply Bayesian models here. So this is something that they proposed and this looks like a very good field of investigation. And I would actually uh, implore everyone that Tenenbaum and there are some other new psychologists and neurobiologists who have done research alongside with kids and how they interact with doors and when they know how to open a door. And even if you do not explicitly show them, and if there is a variation, they kind of know what to do about this. And this will talk, uh, we'll talk about this and uh, as we move forward today. So abstract knowledge is inherently encoded in probabilistic generative model. Okay and a kind of a model which describes the ca causal process. Now this causality is a tricky thing, okay? In the world giving rise to the learners and all the observation as well, observe, unobserved, and latent variables. Not everything that is just happening right in, in front of us. There would be a lot of things which would happen which are not in front of us and there would be latent fundamental means hidden variables. And that effectively kind of ensure that whatever the action you are taking, and the learner would be able to infer the hidden state that is going on. Now, abstract knowledge takes the form of structured and symbolic representations such as graph, grammar, predicate logic, relational schemas, and functional programs. Now, these kind of forms of knowledge itself can be inferred by a probabilistic generative model. So this was this paper says that all of these structured and symbolic representation. And I think in the next video, we will talk about neurosymbolic. So this will actually come in very handy. Okay, and through the use of relational data structures such as graph schemas, tempers for graph based on types of nodes, probabilistic graph grammars. And this is where hierarchical Bayesian models come into play. They address the origin of hypothesis space, prized by posting not just a single level of hypothesis to explain the data, but multiple levels of hypothesis space of and with the priors on priors. Like because as things happen in sequence, there are priors built in in our real world. An application of these priors, as you might understand in Bayesian equation, would help you estimating the posterior far better than just simply the likelihood. Okay. And here you guys can see this example that, uh, now again, there is always a comparison with the state of art, like, and that happens to be deep neural network. But the overall idea here is deep neural networks, let's say you can take an example of the causal process. Uh, Let's say you talk about Go, okay, and we all know about Alpha Go, Alpha Zero, right? And we, we know this that they have able to learn, and of course, they use reinforcement learning, they use the CNN to figure out the features, and then they also use the Markov. Uh, sorry, uh, I think they use like this uh, uh, Monte Carlo tree, uh, Monte Carlo search tree, and over there, they kind of do the search and try to figure out which is the best policy. Now, the overall idea, like as with this picture, you can see here that they have this uh, tree here. And here we try to calculate the probabilities. Now, we need to know what is the most opportunistic move or again, in long run, what we could do, which could solve the problem or there would be a tree policy and then there is a default policy. So based on this idea, like based on searching the whole tree or whichever path seems most optimal in terms of rewards, we try to decide where we are going or what should be our next optimal policy. Now, the overall discussion here kind of comes with this idea itself, that the causal model of the world which supports explanation and understanding rather than this pattern cognition. And I think we have mentioned this earlier. Okay, we have mentioned this earlier, that just getting the pattern cognition done is not gonna solve our problems. It's an important step, but it does not solve everything that comes in our way. And uh, unless we do not have a world model involved, and I think that was which, what we talked last uh, last video itself. So using physics and psychology, the idea is we want to use them as our basis of learning. Now, of course, there is always a kind of a trade-off, like you also do not want to put too many priors over there, okay? Because then you very, very much become restricted to the space that you have learned. And what if it is not able to transfer that knowledge, okay? So we also want to see like using composition and learning how to learn, this is called meta-learning to generalize knowledge. Now, all of this is in research phase. I cannot say any of this is a complete knowledge that we have right now, which could solve our problems. Okay. And again, it's not that it's, uh, but some companies have started to make progress here. And uh, Facebook has something called uh, PhysicNet or PhysNet. 
Now, although I will say uh, they actually did not do anything after that. So I am very doubtful that how much this we can trust. But I remember this, seeing these papers early days. And uh, the idea was to reason about the world and make prediction about the processes and the outcome of the actions. Okay. And some recent research, this is like Facebook, Sacnet is available. And you guys can have a look into this. But they have only done the first step. It's not something very comprehensive, even if you ask me. Now, someone like me would say that, okay, why don't we go on psychology? But psychology is another uh, box of hidden uh, hidden surprises that can, so, uh, that can be thrown in your way. And of course, we have innate reasonings about agents, goals, and motives, which can significantly speed up learning in some cases. Although, and we will talk about this, uh, this does give a very big problem uh, because now you are building too many priors here. And what if, as we understand psychology, overall, yes, it is a field of study, but still there is so much undetermined in this field, okay? And overall, at a populist level, we might be able to come up with some truths or something close to a mathematical truth, but it's still very debatable what's the real answer of it. So, <clears throat> The overall approach that we have is learning as a model building is much closer to human learning than learning as pattern recognition. Now, we definitely build these mental models and we combine them and we keep growing concepts as we grow throughout our life. So by reusing and generalizing learned models, humans can learn much richer concepts using only tiny fraction of examples required by the pattern cognition approach. Okay, And this is what we want to do and this is where uh, the authors also represent or represent their work in Bayesian program learning. Okay. And the building blocks are definitely compositionality that you compose things. Okay, first, you want to recombine simpler blocks to obtain a richer system. And uh, it will be much faster than rebuilding everything from scratch. So you can just use the system that you already have engaged with. Causality, a very important discussion to be had. Without analyzing the causal relationship between objects, which is related to physical and psychological analysis, uh, neural networks can get wrong conclusion. And again, it is it goes in both ways, actually. Okay, If the causal understanding is missing, if we are just working on pattern formation or pure correlation, we can get really wrong outcomes. Okay, And uh, again, uh, any two numerical uh, columns have can have correlation. But it doesn't inherently mean like, it goes or there is a connectivity between them. So I could make an argument that, okay, maybe a process goes from A to B. Okay, so maybe process is there and uh, maybe uh, you have, okay, so you you take this path, A to B. Okay, there are not a lot of processes from A to B you can go, but correlation actually goes both ways. Uh, so if you calculate correlation, A to B correlation and B to A correlation is exactly the same thing. But not every process can go from A to B and then same B to A. No, that's not how the world works. There are some processes, as we understand, let's say, if you are falling from the roof. Now, if there is a correlation, reverse correlation cannot be established if somehow you were to go back to the roof. That just can't happen. That's not how our world works, right? Uh, gravity is there and it will influence, but correlation kind of goes both ways. So without this, it is going to be really tricky. Okay, there are pathways which most of them and plus there are latent variables and everything. So a very common example I think about is the relationship between the <clears throat> uh, the temperature rise and the goggles or sunglasses that we use. Now everyone just thinks, yeah, that is that is the relation and that is what we should think about. But then I remark them that actually is not true because if you were to go to a lot of areas in the world which, which are dry and even when there is minus 10 degrees uh, centigrade temperature, uh, if there is a uh, snowfall uh, all around, you will not be even be able to walk on the roads without sunglasses. Yeah, because that snow, white snow, actually reflects light back to you. So there are a lot of parts of the world which are extremely dry and they might get snow. Okay, uh, the issue is it would be completely sunny outside and there would be negative 10 degree centigrade. And uh, you have to go out for some purpose or you have to drive your vehicle, right? And the, that it reflects the light, that's the problem. And you will not be able to drive or even walk properly without sunglasses. So the latent variable is the sunlight. And yes, I totally understand as in most parts of the world, as the temperature increases, usually we do get more sunlight. But the what, the reverse part is also actually true that in a lot of parts of the world which are dry, it is not all cloudy and dewy in the cold winter. Many times it is actually sunny. Even after the snowfall, it could get very sunny. Okay, so that's, that's the thing. And learning to learn. Last, I think the last thing is 
meaning speeding of the learning when similar or related concepts. So if I already know, and we have talked about this transfer learning, right? That if I already have seen a similar example, I would be able to use that example, but we should be able to transfer that domain knowledge. Uh, and I do not have to learn everything from scratch, but that is not what happens with neural networks. Uh, although we have made some progress in transfer learning, but I think it is a long way to go. Okay. I think, uh, so Tamil, you introduced this idea of prospective learning. So why don't we hear it out from you itself? And uh, so what do you think about yes. uh, prospective learning or retrospective? Yeah, learning? thank you. Yeah, right. that's right. <laughs> yes. So thank you, Amrita, for giving me a beautiful introduction. So prospective learning is just the exact opposite of retrospective learning. Now, retrospective learning is what we all do. All machine learning algorithms do retrospective, meaning you have some historical data and you try to predict the future. Now, based on that, say be it sales, be it uh, sales forecasts, sales predictions, or uh, spends, marketing, all these things. So you have historical data, you have years of data. So I, am, I want to analyze 10 years of data to analyze the trends and things. Now, you have a historical data, you try to predict what will be uh, my, my prediction for the next one year, say next quarter, next six months, next one year, just to a rough estimate. Now, this is the retrospective learning which we all do. Now, prospective learning is just the exact opposite. So, in prospective learning, what it is, so you analyze that. Now, you in prospective learning, it is something you want, you predict for unknown futures, meaning we all do that. Suppose you are in a situation, okay? Now, in those situations, you try to think what will be the possible way out of that. Then you try, then say, say for example, different scenarios. Out of those five different scenarios, you will choose only one mm -hmm. or max two. Okay. Now, how do you choose that? You have some, might be that you reason it, uh, I mean, inside you. So you, so your internal world model will tell you that, okay, if I am in this scenario, so what it will do, the brain is actually simulates thing. Now you will place yourself in that scenario. Say you have five to A, B, C, D, E. You will place yourself in each one of the scenarios and try to find out which one is the most optimum and which one is the, I mean, you will have certain criteria, of course, uh, and then you will decide on that, which one will be, will be most optimum for you. Based on that, you see, you use that. Now, prosperity, now prosperity learning is important because as I said, like intelligence itself is very broad. We don't have a clear set definition of intelligence. Many authors from various domains have given the define intelligence in their own way. Now, mm -hmm. intelligence did not necessarily mean that you have, you, you analyze historical data, you then they predict the future. Right. Intelligence, one part of intelligence also, you predict unknown futures. You simulate, you think of something, like you are in a situation how to go out of that. Or you think of, um, say, I mean, good scenario. Say, for example, you dream, when you're in a school, say, I, I'll be in 10, then you dream of, okay, I'll be, I'll take science. Okay, I'll go to engineering, I'll go to commerce, I'll go to arts, history, all these things. You dream, I mean, in, in your internal model, you think of various scenarios where you could be hmm. and yeah. where you will end up depends on how good a marks you got and exactly where you are getting, I mean, how you are applying. It can hmm. happen that in at the, at the 10th standard, you think something else. Now, by the time you reach 12, you're your all the wall perception changes. Okay, then you decide, no, I'll be, I'll go here, I'm very good at this, I, I'll pursue this. So it changes. So your internal model changes, then your perception changes, then your decision will change, then you, but you actually think, thought of those scenarios in your brain, inside you. Whether you use it or not, that's different, but actually you thought of. Now that is what pros prospective learning, now that is intelligent. You have retrospective, you have, you, you have prospective. Now, both of these are important for an agent. Uh, for our wall model, our internal wall model, we use both of these uh, at the same time, but for an agent to explore the world, it also needs to understand uh, all these things. Now, moving on. This paper is really good. You should go through it. I mean, it's very, I mean, very intuitive and it's very, uh, it is written in a very plain language. I mean, with very less mathematical uh, stuff. Now, this diagram will explain. Now, this is now, which is the present, and then mm -hmm. you are going to a future. Future state, yeah. Now, future state. Now, present state to future state. What are the components that it might affect? One, obviously, curiosity. 
you will explore humans are in uh, i mean inborn curious we are curious without curiosity we won't exist and we'll, i mean uh, then there's something called causal obviously causality has to be the cause and effect obviously you'll take yeah, that yeah. decision that will uh, that is going to affect you in some way positive way and then there is something called continual meaning that it has to continue it is continually i mean it's, it's part of continual learning which we introduced sometimes back like lifelong learning continual learning all these things so it has to happen i mean you should continuously able to learn and adapt yourself and you cannot hold on to some thoughts like 10 years back you had something and you say that i won't change this is my thought mm-hmm. i mean then what will happen you will become obsolete obviously you will not going to because uh, around us everything changes uh, right. then and there so yeah then once so from now to future obviously it won't be easy you will have some constraints you need to overcome now what those constraints are is like it, it, it those are some of the assumptions or presumptions that will actually help you make that optimal decision now you don't have unlimited resources okay you don't have unlimited time unlimited you will have constraints in those areas you will have other constraints as well now those will make you understand that is your intelligence comes into the picture like using intelligence you have a finite amount of resources and time how to make best use of that to yeah. get from point a to point b like from no, now no, to the future to limited resources limited time yes yeah. it has to be otherwise if, it, if if everything was infinite then uh, this domain wouldn't have existed yeah <laughs> so yeah, yep so this is the these are so this is what uh, the prospective learning is all about the diagram actually explains that uh, mm-hmm. like you have now state you have future state you have all these things all these constraints you have curiosity causality continual learning right. so this will help you from you use this we don't understand that because brain is very efficient in that brain does this everything in a fraction of a second it you won't fail every Hey, what happened? Uh, I think we lost it. Is it? Sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm sorry. Yep. So, as I said, like you have a now state, not a, a task that matters to you right now, uh, and then you have a future state. The task and context. Now, the future is defined like that. At some point in time, is the task and the concept that will matter at some point in the time in the future. Now, you want to. You, you are in twelfth. You want to go to say, I want to learn physics. I want to become a physicist. Are you? on to expose to invent things so those is the future state and that is the present state that you can now you will have all this journey ahead now all these things will matter so based on that you will go from point a to point b. now if you move on now as i said what are the key factors as in the diagram is say continual learning is the main thing obviously a system has to forget previously learned the information while acquiring new stuff now this is retention comes into the picture now with continual learning it is like i mean obviously you can't retain everything that you are learning or everything that you are seeing obviously some part will be chucked out and some part will be retained now what you want to retain uh, that depends and uh, but continual learning has to happen you have to update your so you, so this process this cycle is very i mean in a layman's term it's it's like learn al unlearn and then relearn so yeah, this is a cycle yeah. we we use that every day in our work on so it's learn unlearn uh, unlearn relearn so this cycle meaning continual learning is happening lifelong learning this is a cycle you, you learn you grow you you learn something you then unlearn few things then you relearn few, few new things so this happens so that's continual learning now if you move on now constraints as i said these are built in priors these are like assumptions that you can't move around much now constraints such as built in priors and inductive bias we have biases in in i mean inside us now now those help us shrink the hypothesis space now as i said like constraints help you to minimize the search space that those will help you you know to choose what path you want now obviously you will have constraints are there that's why you are okay i have this much amount of money i can only spend this much now based on that so we do something called budgeting if we buy a phone if we buy a new electronics gadget we do something because you have a constraint with money you'll only look for those that are the, that will fill in and around your budget that means you are reducing your search space now obviously if you have in, in a whole lot of money you'll go to some other but based on the budget constraints you will choose 
only those gadgets that are, that will fit your budget. That means you are reducing your search space, and then that will help you make a good decision among that. Now, this is where constraints come to the picture. That because, mm -hmm. as I said, because because intelligence has finite data space and time. As I said earlier, like intelligence means you are working with a finite set of resources and time. You will make your decision using those using those resources that are available to you right now. It cannot be infinite. It is not infinite. It is constraint. I mean, it is finite. Then you take the uh, call, take the decisions, and all. that's what the uh, you know prospective learning and all these things comes into picture because you will visualize in, inside your head you're using your internal all model what can be the most best optimum way, optimum scenarios. Now okay. moving on. Yeah, curiosity, causality. As I said, intelligent, I mean, intelligent systems to take action that the AI aims to use in, in the future rather than the present. Now, with curiosity, what happened? A goal aimed at maximizing rewards and a goal aimed at to, to maximum relevant information. Now, with curiosity, what happens? You do both. I am curious about something unless you are, unless you have, I mean, it can happen that you are reading something uh, to understand something like you am a maximize rewards like you need to so if you want to explore something that means you will have to add, uh, i mean gain something out of it and then relevant information like you are exploring because say for example you are fond of history now you will explore historical places you will try to know about ancient monuments and all that means you are enriching your knowledge itself relevant based on what you desire you will do those you will aim the reward maximizing rewards then maximize the relevant information. And so that is the goal of curiosity. And True. then causality, mm -hmm. yes. Yeah. And then cause and effect, obviously. You want to do something, you'll get out of it. Now, intelligent system learns so because in causality, what happens? You choose those actions that will determine specific outcomes. Like that's how you decide which of the future states is possible. Because not all the states will be possible or, or, or will be beneficial to you. You'll only choose those states that will be very optimal. And that will have some benefit uh, for me. That's how we choose uh, a future state. That's where causality comes into the picture. Now, using all these things, the intelligent agent has to use all these things, has to have all this because we have everything. Using these techniques, the agent has to explore the world, then exploit the world, and then. So this is where prospective learning comes to the picture. Club to retrospective learning, this is how the agent will learn in the world. Exactly. So it's, yeah. Now moving on. Hmm. Interesting discussion. Yep. Yeah. So, Amrita, so causality, obviously that's one of the key components as we saw in every, most of our slides, I mean, most of our talk, this term has come at some point in time. I mean, it has come repeated every time. Now, can you explain a bit more on causality? Yeah, yeah, I could, I could actually. This is the field I've been actually very fascinated for quite some years now. And so the book of Y came, and I think that I can recommend to everyone uh, if you want to get deeper here. Although Judah Pearl has written a book called Causality itself in the same field, that's more mathematical. Book of Y actually is more descriptive. So any book which works for you, you can go ahead with it. So why causality is required is very, very interesting actually, okay. And uh, again, I think whenever we are doing scientific experimentations, and I, I talked about correlation already. So whenever you are trying to do a statistical analysis or, or any kind of a, a mathematical analysis or some optimization, what you can come as, there could be multiple scenarios that would come out and e they will look equally plausible to you, okay. That this could also happen, this could also happen. The question is what, where should we go? Because we will run into the same problem. And the idea is that causality is first of all going to give you a world view, a world model, okay? It will tell you what's possible and what's not possible. Or let's, let me uh, rephrase that, sorry. It will tell you what's highly probable and what's not that highly probable. That is what you, you will actually get. Let's not get into the discussion of possible here. And usually three ladders, three ladders. And I think as we grew as humans, I think all the three ladders really, really matter to us, okay? And first is association that if two things, and this is very close to correlation, right? Uh, two things keep on happening together and we kind of start to see, oh, it looks like there is a correlation. So I could make an argument that whenever we have some rains in Bangalore, uh, people reach late to office or come back late to home. 
So one simple trick could be, or the way we could associate is, rain must worsen the scenario or the uh, water uh, deluged all over the roads. Okay, that would mean the cars and the vehicles would have to move slowly. Uh, and that would mean everyone would be delayed, right? This is how you can form one association very easily. Okay, so let's say how you talk about how variables are related. And this is correlation. So most people can think that, okay, this is something we can explain through correlation. Although still, which one causes what is not a guarantee because you cannot always say whenever the traffic was slow, it was raining. You cannot say that. There could be multiple reasons why traffic was slow. Maybe some accident happened. Maybe some construction work is ongoing, right? Or maybe it is the peak time. <laughs> it is peak Bangalore fundamentally. So a uh, lot of reasons could be there why traffic might be moving slow. Rain is just one of them. Okay. And this would be extremely relevant in uh, any kind of disease detection or whenever a doctor is trying to uh, diagnose you. This is what they have to do. They might get symptoms. And let's say you say I have got a fever. Now, fever itself is not really a disease, as you know, it's fundamentally a symptom. And it is symptom to hundreds of the, uh, other actual diseases in which you could have fever. Now, the issue is, apart from fever, what else you might have? Uh, do you have cold and cough? Or do you have some kind of a dysentery? Or do you have, like, you, you are getting shivers, right, regularly? Or you have let, lost that smell, uh, uh, like, sense of taste and smell, right? That is what happened in COVID. It was start as co uh, a fever. But then you will start to lose your sense of taste and maybe smell as well. And that is where COVID was slightly different than your common flu, right? So that is your association. The second one is intervention. Okay, now I know this. Okay, I know this, how things are happening when one is going from there. How can I make this happen? Or if I had to repeat the results, how can I make this happen? And this is where intervention will be there. So the idea is if I am getting a fever, let's say I'm feeling feverish, okay? Should I take paracetamol or should I do something else about this? What if we ban cigarettes or what if we ban all the soda, all the sugary drinks, then what happens to economy, right? Because it's just not like your personal life, that's fine. But then what happens to economy? Let's say if I shut down Coca-Cola, what happens to so many workers uh, who work at Coca-Cola, right? Then what happens? That is what we have to see. And then the counterfactual. Then the counterfactual. This is the ultimate one. This is where you as a scientist or maybe as a computer scientist, you really, uh, this is what you actually do most of the time. You have to imagine things. And in those imaginations itself, you have to provide some counterfactuals. You say that if we would have done this, then what was the counter? And then counter to that, let's say you take one argument and you say, okay, we kill Hitler, okay, when he was a baby, okay. And then the counterfactual is, maybe, no, it doesn't matter. Maybe it was all product of the World War I and the way Germany was treated. If not Hitler, someone else would have come. Then what would he have done? Right? Or maybe it could have gone into some other direction. What if Germany would have disintegrated? Then what would have happened? And these counterfactuals, once you start discussing, become really, really interesting. And this is what you say. Why is something happening? This is what we want to discuss and kind of diagnose with causality. All right. So this is like very interesting. So this is where uh, we can kind of progress and we can introduce complications or like we could try to unravel the complications that we have in our uh, any modern day system. And causal inference is extremely necessary, okay? This is to interpret any improvement in the prediction by altering any of the features. Like this is like a very big industry problem as well. Like people keep asking, uh, okay, so people will use deep learning and then they will ask, okay, tell me which feature has impacted it. It's really hard to tell, like you must notice this and you might know because you have also worked with clients that it is so hard to tell. And then you have to go back to maybe decision tree, random forest, some kind of a regression because over there you are able to show them, okay, this is what correlation is. And plus again, same idea. If I make some changes to my model, okay, then what happens? Okay. And like cause and effect is a very big tricky thing. Each one can start impacting the other one and it could start a chain reaction. Okay. And uh, what outcomes are more probable, that is definitely what we need to know. And uh, also to ensure that which assumptions that are made are explicit, that you have explicitly made those assumptions and to and specifically to validate the robustness and to validate the robustness and predictions particularly when the models have been developed. So you want to see that, okay, if I tinker with the data, what happens? So I think this was a very good question. I, I'm forgetting who really asked at the first one and said, okay, a grade with alpha zero and alpha two and everything. So let's say if I simply say the, 
Now, I might be getting the terms wrong, and for our international viewers, I understand. Uh, we Indians use a slightly different terms, okay, for chess. So I think that it was like the horse that we use, and it takes two and a half steps, okay? Two and a half steps. What if the horse actually starts taking three steps? Let's say we change the rules, game rules, just a minor, just a bit, okay? And say, actually, no, horse will go straight three steps at a time. Then would the AI algorithm will be able to adopt? Or like, because this was given as an example that humans will require 10, 12 plays at max to understand the new game and get on with it. See, in cricket, football, we keep changing the rules time and again. And it will not take us from childhood again, someone has to play. But what they showed was, it was disaster. If that happens, even if a couple of rules are changed, the whole retraining has to happen. And this is a very big problem, guys. We just mm. cannot have this scenario. So this causal inference or causality discussion became extremely important. And I think Judaipur is definitely the lead of our kind of the thought leader here. And he has done great work here as well. So. I could definitely make an argument that uh, Judapal is leading this research, but other researchers have also started to look, look into this one. And this is this is the thing so, that he talks about these, <clears throat> because the overall idea is to that we want to mimic human-like intelligence. And he wants to uh, argue that if we want machines to reason with interventions, what if we ban cigarettes or what if we ban sugary drinks or, and then introspection, like what if I had finished high school or if I have not finished high school, we have to invoke causal models. Like there are a lot of things uh, and you cannot just talk association, the first level association that, oh, let's figure out correlation, what happens. Yeah, that's okay. I'm not denying that. Uh, you could actually see that how many percentage of people who do not finish high school, what happens in their life and how things life uh, goes around for them and people who do follow uh, finish high school or then college, what happens to, but still that's correlation and many ways it is very hard to prove the other way around. Okay. And I think uh, Jurapal has been very insistent on this and I'm very glad that he brings this point that a lot of success that we have just gotten in machine learning and uh, we have not really solved the fundamental theoretical problem. It's just that our machines are so powerful and uh, we had neural networks from 1986, 1989, the modern day at least. Okay. So a lot of the problem was data and the hardware was just not available. And I know new architectures have come, I'm not denying that. But the fund of, even the transformers, let's talk transformers, even if I have to go through and uh, stable diffusion models and everything. Yes, it is all great. Stable diffusion models are amazing, but you can just tinker with the causal problems over and then see the bad result. I uh, <laughs> saw the result of a coffee, co coffee cup uh, with holes. And the issue was it showed like, okay, coffee cup has a lot of holes, but the coffee is not spilling out. And that is a disaster. <laughs> immediately that breaks the whole thing like okay fine so yes you it has figured out the association so it knows what holes are or not maybe no but it has figured out that there is some relationship so it was able to portray a cup with holes but the coffee was there it was like holding somehow magically and that is that is the ultimate problem i would implore everyone to look into that example just go to stable diffusion type uh, a coffee cup or cup with tea with holes just type this and see the result you would not believe that blunder it. It's not a blunder. Actually, it's not a blunder. See, that mathematics or the world of causality is still very unexplored. And we will need to develop the right language even to express causality. Probability itself is not being, like people are not confident that just based on probability, we will be able to explain this. So this is, this is something that even I have learned from the work that I have done here. So would you like to talk about the overall idea yes. of the world models and how everything now comes together? Yes. Now, overall idea of all models. Thank you, Amitans, for giving the wonderful uh, uh, explanation of causality. Now, if we want to talk about world model as a whole, now, this paper, you should go through. It is very good. It's actually part of a talk which was given mm -hmm. by very famous researchers and all. Now, world model for perception, control, and language. Now, this is very important. Now, perception, control, and language are important as we are human beings, we deal with these three things every day, every second. Without them, we won't be able to move forward anything. Now, what they tell is that human intelligence is roughly consists of two major components, the lower part and the upper part. Now, lower mm -hmm. part, which is called the animal OS, uh, they have termed this crudely as animal OS, animal operation, because this is the part where, I mean, this comprises the wall models and controller deals with real world patterns and take actions based on them. Meaning this is the main thing. Okay. 
Now, this is how we do it. We, we deal with the real problems. We, we see the patterns and everything, and then we take the action based on those. Now, the upper part is the uh, symbol system, which will deal with neurosymbolic AI, which will be the, uh, our next video. Now, symbol system deals with language. Now, we hear things, utterances, things that produces the utterance, according, we call it language. Yeah. Now, if you see, this is the very specific to human intelligence. Now, language app, what hap happens is language app calls and uses the world models of animal words as a module. Now, when a world model is triggered by language. So it is a simulator. It, you can think of like, we imagine many things like flying cars and, you know, giants using that. So moment you tell stories, we try to imagine. That's called a mental canvas, we call it. Like this internal world model, we immediately visualize stuff. Because... We, if we visualize, we we understand things better if it's a visual diagram rather than a table or like or written something. Now, if you see here in the diagram, like there are linguistic inputs. We have hearing, you have utterance, you think, you recollect, and all everything. Those get processed, and your mental canvas then works on, and you imagine things. So this is how. So, so you so that imagining part, like that that is part of the internal world model. Now that is how we human we use every day every second of the moment someone tells something we immediately visualize because this process happens so fast we don't actually uh, uh, get that lag or uh, we don't really actually uh, understand how how fast the process will happen we take it for granted like uh, okay i visualize you said i visualize like that it's very fast for right. processing yeah so this is how this you should go through this paper so this is how the our uh, structure i mean uh, our all body structure inside us now, if you move on. Now, this one, we did cover it, but uh, for uh, the sake of our discussion, we'll cover it again. And uh, this is Lekun's paper, Jan Lekun's paper on uh, self-supervised learning or the autonomous machine, machine learning system. Now, now self-supervised learning is one type of learning that you observe in humans and animals, like babies seem to learn concepts, basic concepts out of the world in the first few months of their life. Like they observe and they learn. Uh, like they observe the adults around them and they want to mimic them. By mimicking, they are learning. Now, self-supervised learning is basically learning to fill in the blanks, as I said, uh, like video clip, text, like uh, the self-supervised learning, you, you use this. Suppose there is a picture in front of me. If I tear it in half, you'll still understand what the picture, I mean, you're still inside your mind, you will be able to complete that picture. Because you have seen it, you understand how the picture should be. Now, yeah. yeah. Now, cost function indicates the instantaneous cost of the state of the world. Now, if you go back uh, to the slide, yeah, sorry. I, I, yeah, I'll just quickly go through this to connect to the uh, thing. Uh, so cost function basically indicates the in instantaneous cost of the state of the world. Now, the critic part would be a trainable function. Now, it is going to estimate and predict in advance what ultimate cost uh, of the outcome it is going to have. Now, actor is going to either run this policy network or, in that case, completely reject it, acquire it, or it, it, it does something else. Like, it, what it will do is it will try to optimize the cost through the optimization. It will optimize the cost, and, and then there's perception, which is actually understanding the real world system. Now, this is how the system is connected. Now, you, go, you should go through this paper uh, once. Uh, I mean, it's very good. Uh, so, yeah, moving on. Now, here you see this is a connection. Now, if you understand this, you might have seen these connections everywhere, like in an inverted format, like in a, a, a neural network or yeah, yeah. anything. But so, this is how these authors claim, like this is how the neural systems learn to infer. Like we think about nature of a world model in terms of what it means to recognize or infer elements of the world. Yes. Actually, what happens is when we try to, uh, as a curious species, humans, we try to infer everything. We try to find answers to everything. We try to connect things so that we understand the world better. The reason we do that, because we want to understand the world better. We want to understand what is going on around us better, like in nature or something else. Now, this is how we infer. Now, the process of making inferences involves a combination of a large variety of cues, beliefs, based on the cues. Now, we have certain beliefs inside us. We have certain cues inside us. Now, based on those, we try to um, understand the world. Now, the sketch is a formal mathematical relationship between such interconnected recurrent circuits. Now, it is something called as undirected probabilistic graph models. Like, I, I think Amrita stole that in, in the earlier slides. Like, this is how internally we generate the graphs 
this is how everything we connect inside us because these things happen so fast we don't understand i mean we, i mean we don't feel that but using those probabilistic graphs we think this conceptual sketch which we call it uh, this sketch we try to connect things like the nikane nodes in a reciprocal manner like all the nodes are connected to each other that means that each node actually you can go from one node to another node like this this node can cause that node I mean, this event can cause that event. So this is how it is. Everything is connected. So this is how the neural networks learn, like infer, like they try to find that hidden patterns, and then it tries to infer something out of it. Now, if yeah. we move on, yeah. So this slide is very important, given because it is learning methods and models, like learning to learn, as we saw in the earlier in one of the slides, like. See, generating human level agile movements or dexterous manipulation in real world remains unsolved because our current AI techniques are not that efficient to emulate exactly a human being in terms of uh, motor, uh, I mean, sensory motor like a movement of hand, legs, and overall body. Therefore, learning from humans, this is one concept, and the human in the loop approach. Uh, human in the loop approach is very important because so these two approach learning from humans and human in the loop because human in the loop is something that if you have a machine learning system some part at some point you need to have this human input you have to keep the human inside that loop i mean that system so that he can do whatever he i mean he is meant to do like and <clears throat> if we look into the current research level like see the is Toward human-like intelligence, we have various learning frameworks developed: like supervised, unsupervised, semi-supervised, weekly supervised. We have uh, reinforcement learning, everything, noise robust learning. Now, from neuroscience point of view, we have like Abelian learning, back propagation. From learning models like simple models, simple linear models, to complex uh, complex kernel method, deep neural networks. Now, in deep neural networks, we have like uh, Convolutional neural network, recurrent neural network, LSTM, RNN, and every other thing, transformers, everything, attention yeah, yeah. networks, everything has come. So, see, all these things, so from supervised to noise level, so learning methods have been there, so from linear to deep neural networks, so all these things. So, this is the current state of the learning models, what we have at our disposal, what has been discovered. Many things yet to be discovered, but based on, if we combine all those things, it's not easy because we're still trying to find out how our human brain works, but these are some of the things which from research have, uh, we, we have found out that our brain uses all these things. So obviously these things are important if we want to think of an uh, intelligent agent going forward. Yeah, now of course, on. I agree with this. Yeah. Yes. Uh, there was this now, very famous debate, yes. and I think we both can discuss this. I think we both have watched yes. these debates, and between yeah, Yarley yeah. Kuhn and uh, with Gary Marcus, it kind of goes on. And Yarley Kuhn uh, is more of, uh, like, okay, both of them are researchers, but Yarley Kuhn, I would always have a little higher steam in the uh, terms of AI because he has developed uh, CNN and he has been working with Facebook AI research as well. And although, but there are the ways they both interpret information, I think Gary Marcus and Jan Lincoln. So there is some difference over there. And But okay, there are certain points we can definitely talk about or say, which we understand. And uh, many times it is like there is no AGI. And Jan Lincoln actually says this a lot. And I think I mentioned this earlier that Maybe human level AI may be useful goals, but even Jan Lekun says even humans are specialized. Although I think I have made a very clear cut point even in the very first video that see, let's not fight about the terminology here. Exactly what you want to say, I totally get it. But the overall discussion according to me is, do we have a set of common uh, principles or uh, protocols or even algorithms, let's formalize them as algorithms for now, that can learn and keep on learning. And again, with compositionality and your idea of causality, okay, and world models and everything, everything comes in between here. And the big answer is no. There does not exist a singular model physical design. You can name it whatever you want to later someday. But my argument actually, uh, even in the first video was that, why does it matter? If you could figure out a principle, can we not engineer it and actually make it uh, generalized in terms of machine? Because machines are inherently more powerful than that. That's so I understand. Let's say humans are not that powerful. Yes, we have limitations, biological limits. Okay, we will get tired. Our brain will get tired. Or like we will bored. We will get bored, right? We cannot analyze uh, TVs only. Right. But why does that matter? Yes. If I could figure out the right principle to analyze 10 MB of data, let's say, and which let's say humans can, let's say. And if I could extrapolate that, I could just come up with clusters of machine and that could, and this is what has happened, right? With NVIDIA's GPU revolution, this is what has happened. 
a singular gpu card these days tamar could have 6000 to 8000 cuda chips that's just a boggling number once you think about this yes we yes, used to right. have like three four cores in our pentium not pentium forget pentium i5 i7 and we would be yeah. so happy now it is just just a joke like you can have as much computation as you want at a very minimal cost and uh, so research community is making some progress up, i think uh, around human level artificial intelligence would you agree with that tamam i guess yes mm. because i see if you think of what deep mind recently did like alpha 0 alpha go mm -hmm. uh, mu 0 gato recently so they are all trying to go to that holy grail of in, uh, system which is the autonomous system which is the generally intelligent systems now there has been loads of research like you, you name like numenta vicarious ai facebook is yeah, yeah. doing that all these things all the all these companies are investing and all these companies are coming out deep mind itself and all these companies are trying to come out with the algorithm that is that will be capable of doing most of the tasks one algorithm mm -hmm. doing many things like stanford recently developed foundation models now ghetto foundation models all these things are like i i'll say these are like precursors of what we yet to achieve now i will agree with the statement that uh, that human that there are res uh, researches going on both university and uh, industry level that uh, to get that uh, human level ai research uh, I, I mean human level ai system although it is we are still a few years away from achieving that but at least the progress is there we can see many research papers are coming out where there are articles there are um, conferences talks uh, and all these things but yeah i agree with this statement at least that uh, there are research going on at some progress towards human level ai at least the efforts are being made now. Uh, yeah, definitely, the definitely. Yeah. And yes, this is this is the critique and as well as that advantage here that scaling up has definitely helped us. It is necessary. And yeah, like could actually point this regularly that a uh, lot of times we think that okay, we had so much time, why did we not develop AGI or like sorry, forget AGI, like any proper AI as a matter of fact. And Yan Lekun points out in terms of scaling up, the scale up factor around across our brain compared to a silicon chip has been very recently uh, kind of uh, like leveled up. Okay, like it has happened like in the last four or five years itself. It's not that news like you, we did not have this much computation and at any point. So even if someone had this idea of simulating all the, uh, from that many number of neurons and that many number of connections and artificially, we just did not have this resource. It has happened very recently actually. And yes, there are some ideas that could happen and maybe could just happen in near, uh, near the future, near future where generalized idea of self-supervised learning can come. And I think Jan Lekun has mentioned this time and again about self-supervised learning that this is where he sees the next revolution happening. Okay. Now, the one issue is, and I think Judaipal also says this, that we do not know how many such new concepts are required. This is something normal. <laughs> and I always tell people who my mentor, and I think I think to, uh, told Tamil as well at long back, actually, yes. that see, this is the biggest problem. We do not know how many of them are actually required. So Correct. any progress that we make, always there could be holes in the theory. Like you can come and Correct. say, oh, you do not satisfy this one. So this will take time. <laughs> it is like those, I think this is very similar to what physics was in early, early 1980, uh, like yeah, early 1900s. Okay. Everything was uncertain. We thought like we knew what is the structure of atom later. We found out, no, we don't know anything like that. We thought like, we thought like everything is a particle. Later we found, no, 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 that's not true. It's a particle wave duality. <laughs> Still, we are figuring yeah. things out. But yes, yeah, a exactly. lot of major chunks were like figured out in those early 1900s. And you can look into various physics uh, Nobel Prize recipients at that point. And you will see that they did crush or like figure out uh, uh, different problem statements or kind of work out different principles, which are bedrock of our work every day here itself. Okay. And of course, no one can then, because you do not know how many concepts are required, you cannot also predict how much time it will take to achieve human yeah. intelligence. Yeah. And Jan Lekun, and I think even Gary Marcus, and everyone <clears throat> basically thinks the same thing, that it's just not a matter of scaling up. You cannot just keep scaling up and say that unless you do not have that learning paradigm, it's not going to work. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And this is this is a very big problem that I think everyone agrees on, right? Agrees. Yeah, agree okay. with that. Yes. And again, then there are different uh, ideas and some says that, okay, uh, some says transformer is all you need or attention is all you need. And some people believe only reward. So someone says reward, think reinforcement learning. 
okay and some things are like gary marcus is very much into symbolic manipulation and this is why we want yeah. to talk about neurosymbolic in the very next uh, yeah. session actually and uh, although lekun believes that you have to learn the world by observing like uh, how, the, right. how babies learn right and uh, you have to go into this action mode you cannot just think in a software level and this is something even i am very uh, attached to like unless there is a direct feedback from the environment you will not learn and this is why a lot of simulations are done on games right now okay yeah. and i think i gave this example if someone could solve or could go through let's say a whole gta game let's say grand theft auto 5 that would be impressive that would be seriously impressive because gta is a complex game i like that game okay it's a complex game if somehow you could create artificial model which could navigate a character throughout the gta game driving and shooting people <laughs> robbing banks and what <laughs> Uh, believe me, that would not be a joke. If that happens, that would be exactly. serious proof of very close to a human level intelligence. Correct. And of course, exactly. you want to talk about hierarchical representations. That's where we started today. Uh, that can allow for long-term predictions in abstract spaces. And we want to deal with world which is not completely predictable. And that's, of course, that's why the Bayesian mathematics is fundamentally just there. Right? Exactly. Okay, and Correct. you have these priors and based on priors and a sequence of priors, the outcomes could keep on changing. Correct. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry. I like to add here, like, see, mm -hmm. all these pointers tells us that all the algorithms that currently exist has, like, a, I mean, they have their limitations. We are still yet to, those algorithms are yet to be mastered. I mean, those algorithms are yet to master things, even though Gato and uh, Foundation models have come, but they have their own limitations. Uh, yeah, sure. They... Yeah, and Lekun rightly pointed out all these pointers are actually because see, the world is not predictable; it is uncertain. Yes, we need to observe babies. I mean, with, I mean, the way baby learns mm -hmm. and the way the world works. So all these things we need to. So there are so many moving parts in the world, like to figure out everything that requires training and that yeah, requires yeah. adaptation. So, so as you said, the right example, like in football, many times the rules get changed because of something or something. So yeah. Do we learn football from scratch again? Do we, mm -hmm. Or wh what we do is we adapt to that. We use that rule. We, we incorporate that rule in our in our play. We train accordingly. We do accordingly so that we have minimum effort to convert us. We take into account that and then we we change our gameplay. Yeah, so that's yeah. what we do. We learn football again and from scratch. That's what the machine needs to do. Like that's where it is. I mean, the change needs to happen. The adaptation, transfer learning. So that what needs to happen that it needs to adapt to that thing. The continual learning, lifelong learning, they need to adapt. So yeah, yeah, please. Yeah, of course, I agree with this actually. And this this uh, needs to happen, and we want to also like enable the agents to predict the events uh, effects of like sequence of actions and like whatever Correct. happens and reason and plan. And all of this again kind of comes down to causal discussions itself. Okay, exactly. and uh, we want to plan hierarchically, decompose a complex task into subtasks, and all in these ways that again now Jan Lekun thinks it has to be gradient based learning because then only neural networks can be in the whole party okay otherwise it could be a massive problem right otherwise exactly. what would replace the neural network part in the overall discussion so okay. I think uh, all of these are very big discussions to we have had and just to let our viewers know as well that we are actually planning to start our own research targets and we will actually update this very much in the last video as well and you guys will have our contacts and if someone thinks that there is some common theme that you guys can also reach out to us and we will also like publish some blogs as well so that you will keep on getting updated at what we are doing okay. and guys uh, this is kind of the summary and although i do not want to get into this whole discussion because both parties are somehow right and somehow wrong so i'm trying not to get into this discussion but the basic idea is you have to learn the mechanics of world by observing. You want to predict the influence of an agent throughout these actions. You want to run, uh, learn hierarchical representations and abstract spaces. You want to deal with probabilistic nature of the world. Perfectly correct. Where they do not agree, and this is the biggest point, this is why we even added this slide. Like, uh, the, uh, Marcus says, Gary Marcus says, you will require richer priors. You will require priors or inductive biases. And Jan Lekun says, no, these things can also be learned. Okay. And he does not see, Jan Lekun does not see too much value in leveraging existing symbolic knowledge. Uh, Gary Marcus says, no, we have to use it. And we will actually explore this theme in the next video, actually. And uh, 
Now, Gary Marcus says that whenever AGI comes or something like AGI comes, a large scale symbolic knowledge will be definitely crucial. And I think it will be important. And this is where the kind of the knowledge base actually becomes very important. Okay. And you will require explicit cognitive models. And this is why we are kind of going through them. We want to do operations over variables, in, including storing, retrieving, comparing values. So it is just not like your simple gradient manipula manipulation that we are doing. An explicit type or token distinction will be cr crucial that what explicitly you are determining, what type or token or it is very important. You cannot expect everything to be learned from scratch. And I think this is the major difference between both of them. And I think in some ways, uh, neuro, because we are going to kind of combine this idea of neuro and symbolic. So the new uh, biological or the artificial neural network with the symbolic. And over there, we will kind of expand this discussion. So I think uh, rather than commenting here, we will take this in the next video itself. Okay, and definitely they talk about the overall reference, word and sentence fundamentally do not exist in isolation. And again, this kind of goes into dwells into the idea of language itself. Okay, and then cognitive models that ultimate goal of a language system to be updated, persisting, but the dynamic sense of the world. So understand again, if new words come, it does not mean I have to relearn the whole thing. Yeah, it does not mean that it's just like an add on to the existing things that we already know. Exactly. Okay, and compositionality is like whole sentences or whatever you are interpreting, they are again parts of the system. Okay, the parts of the existing system or existing language that are built. And systems like DALI face clear challenge when it comes to compositionality, okay. And large language models like GPT produce well-formed prose, but do not produce interpretable representation of utterances that reflect structured relationship between part of those sentences. So what we are saying is it can generate sentences, but many times the compositionality or the connectivity is completely missing. You are like, what is, it feels like, okay, two, three random lines have been like sometime put together. And that brings like a lot of complexity or like that brings a lot of distrust. In. So I think, uh, okay, Tawal, so what do you think about language and uh, AJ and the synthetic consciousness? Yes. Now, this is one of my favorite parts, synthetic consciousness and AJ. How, and now, now see, general intelligence, if we start like, it is like manipulating information, sensory data, and stored knowledge, and all everything. So, as we said, intelligence, retrospective learning, prospective learning, we explore, exploit. We have finite amount of resources and time to explore things and to make decisions. That is where intelligence and general intelligence means you will do a set of particular tasks. So, you have one brain and you do so many things like you cycle, swim, you do office, you school, I mean, you teach, you enjoy, you dance, you sing, all these things. So, it's not like uh, different things come up as the same. So you have one brain and you do everything. So it's like one, If so if there is an agent, one agent capable to do all the things. Now, obviously it should have instructions. There should be an instruction sets borrowed from some uh, some CPUs. Like as we have CPUs and instruction sets in the computer, like we should have some clear set of instructions. That's a language and AGI. So that's a language comes into the picture. Now we have dynamic computation like like in as a neural analogy to logical algorithm like there are steps in con uh, like what happens is based on input data we form analogies we dynamically compute based on the input we receive like feed forward network or something like i mean our decision systems uh, i mean the way we take decision depends on how information comes in sometimes it can happen that we are taking decisions and new information so we have to change our decision that means dynamically we are computing things based on the input we see. In, in, I mean the external stimulus. This yeah. needs to happen. So that's why language, as I said, the animal OS and the language app, the, the connection, that's how it is connected. Like you have those inputs coming in from perception. I mean, all those inputs from the world. And then we compute uh, based on that. So yeah, so this is how it is all related. Now moving on. Yeah, so language is the primary means of dynamic computation language is convenient mechanism for dynamic computation and language supports machine reasoning obviously machine learning and machine i mean if you want to reason like that we'll discuss the reasoning in the neurosymbolic app because we need to form those uh, logical diagrams like a to b and all everything yeah yeah, like yeah. Exactly, but it, yeah now the code of language processing association as was discussed earlier in the causality section and one the first step in causal understanding is association that's where language also comes into the picture and language associative nature and naturally gave rise to consciousness. Now, there has been much debate on consciousness, although or whether it can be artificially 
uh, generated. But uh, I think language itself plays a major role in all these things. If you want to associate, if you want to reason, if you want to develop consensus, language is an important part. Language app is there. That's why language app is one of the component of the wall models that we have. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Now, rest are like properties of language. You have uh, small tokens as like sentence, phenomes, letters, sentences, a wide range of words and ideas and statements. Now, complex thoughts, are transformed into fixed size uh, in, in input output channels like with a yeah. less with a loss of expression like without the loss of expression we form sentences and you know, we change we manipulate sentences like that and we have self talk we have conversations we have writing reading and we have open endedness all these things all these are properties of language that's how we perceive the world that's how we interpret the world that's how we take decision based on this so all these things are essential uh, component of a generally intelligent uh, agent or system. Now, moving on. Okay. Now, what do you think? Like, how do you, I mean, okay. So if I ask you this question, like, how do you view language? How important language is if we want to develop a generally intelligent system? Uh, so I think like language would be extremely important and like without language, I do not even think like humans would have become this intelligent and would have ended up kind of ruling and uh, end up like uh, like customizing the ecosystem around us to suit our, our requirements. Okay. Anything that we are inherently doing and language as you might know is more complex challenge for us like compared to the computer vision problem itself. And uh, now language has amazing, like different kind of problems. And specifically, I think like while we are dealing with language, we have to de deal with the temporal scenario. Many times with images, we don't have this issue. But with language, temporal is becomes extremely important for us. Okay. And these uh, sequences of uh, tokens that we are generating and what we are expecting and then what do we go ahead and say it, our brain is actually bringing very complex information. And according to me, a lot of uh, knowledge base in the play over there as well. And this is where, again, knowledge base symbolic uh, rules become so, so very important because you cannot just think pattern recognition here. There are certain rules that language, different languages do follow. Although, again, I will say no current model is inherently that powerful, but with transformer models, yes. we have seen some success. Although, again, yes. once it starts producing a lot of sentences, we do see that the break, breakdown of the compositionality it is not very consistent, yes. but it is really producing. Okay. And yeah. I, I okay. hope that uh, some reasonings uh, based on BERT and GPT, we can do. There is There are Q&A models, okay? So you can actually ask a question and get an answer back over there. And in some simple scenarios, it does work, okay? So there's a good hope that we will be able to crack this problem. And exactly. basically the idea is if you control the language, you can have a control flow for intelligent system and yes. self-talk for reasoning and recursion and these will open up uh, these approaches will open doors for even more research and uh, more complex concepts like even getting causality exactly. involved in the whole discussion right exactly. so it might actually be extremely important to en uh, enhance our narrow intelligence system with a language system at well, yeah adding to that uh, there is mm -hmm. a very good video by steven pinker right, it right, is yeah. it's that it, it is there in youtube like it's mm -hmm. how linguistic helps us understanding the how our brain works right now if, i mean that's I mean, you should go through that video. I mean, yeah, uh, definitely. Very good. Yeah. Language, how language hel helps us understanding our. I think language. I think we'll put that link. Yeah, we'll put that link in our yeah, yeah. overall description so everyone can actually Correct. have a look at that video. That video is actually exactly. amazing. And Stephen Pinker is <laughs> far more knowledgeable than us, as explained. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it makes sense actually that uh, yeah, my right. language is so 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 important for us. Yes, yes, yes. yes. Okay, and uh, I think uh, we can talk about system one and system two. And as you know, the system one is the lazy system, but inherently jumps on the conclusion or it tries to do exactly. things fast, as fast as possible. But when you are thinking system two, you are more conscious, you are actually putting more effort over there. So uh, like, again, while commuting to work, a lot of things can very much happen using system one. You do know how you are going from point A to point B, how which survey you are to taking, how to go through the token or uh, how uh, you can use the pass and everything, right? And it is exactly. effortless, right? So, and this is like, if the subway line is down, then what needs to happen? Then you need to figure out, then uh, system two, or con uh, basically your conscious thinking comes up. And then you start thinking about the quickest route and where maybe uh, you think about buses, is it too cold outside to walk or is it too hot or 
ride share, how much ride share or Uber will cost that day, right? And here, as you can understand, system one is near instantaneous. It is not going to really engage. But inherently, system two is something that is used and many times by conscious understanding. So when you will be developing proper language models, we will be also developing our system two uh, specifically because it is slower but requires more effort. It's more conscious and more logical as a matter of fact. And I think this is where we want to go and we want to develop this. And with system one and system two thinking, this is what we want to develop. And we want to, of course, automate the thinking. So we want to think about unconscious instinctive way. And this could be interchanged used, uh, with system one thinking. But the reasoning and dual process models, these will come and wherever you are thinking about doing something different or again, counterfactuals, right? System two has to get exactly. engaged. And this is where exactly. I think amazingly, uh, oh, language exactly. will be a very important uh, talk or system that we will be requiring. Okay, guys, I think this is something that uh, we can keep talking about large language models, but I don't want to, as a matter of fact, because they can open up a complete uh, different field of discussion. But yeah. understand that these LLMs can be have a potential to be very powerful and it can be difficult to control and assess their impact because their capabilities are practically open. And, uh, of course, there are problems between the general uh, human AI and the large language models, which raises the question how to control and limit their learning. But still, we do not know that, and it is something uh, that further and future research will tell us. And there are a lot of problems with spam and fake news, automated bots, and homework cheating. Uh, and this is where large language models have a role to play. Exactly. Exactly. Correct. Okay, guys, I think this is all for us. And uh, I know this video has been particularly very long, but we thought that we should dedicate ample amount of time. Uh, but soon enough, now we are going to have a look uh, around in the next scenario where we will talk, we will be talking about neurosymbolic AI. This is like a very perfect mix of, you can think about a hybrid scenario where we will be mixing the new, new artificial neural network and the symbolic one. And we will try yeah. to see what these approaches will take us and where they will take us. Uh, thank you, Tamil, and thanks our viewers thank you. for listening in. Bye-bye. Thank, thank, thank you. Thank you. Take care. Bye.